I don't know how many of you know the name of Bruce Schneier, a crypto guru whose book on cryptography was considered so sensitive that the version that included a floppy disk with the code samples was banned from export as a sensitive munition at one point. Bruce says that he was, knew he was destined to be a security guru because when he was 10 and got an ant farm as a gift, they don't come with the ants, they'd be dead you know, from being on the shelf all that time. They come with a postcard that you mail in to get your ants. A typical kid says, cool, I'm going to get ants for my ant farm. Bruce claims that at the age of 10, his reaction was, I can get a box of live ants mailed to anyone I want just by filling in this card. And going beyond being able to make a system do what it was designed to do, to anticipate the ways people might try to make it do something different is really the difference between being a competent engineer and being a competent digital security and privacy professional. I am blessed to be able to bring to you someone who is not merely a competent professional, but a dedicated member of the security and privacy community. Michelle Dunnity has you know, founded a public service organization dedicated to protecting the, the privacy and uh, security of people who might be from populations that don't necessarily have the, the technical skills to, to go out there and, and, and do this for themselves. And just the fact that Intel is going beyond the register as, as the naked and defenseless piece of data and actually took a strong early position in introducing things like you know, no execute bits in the architecture and really allowing the hardware fully to participate in the process of letting us have fun but stay safe. And so I'm really thrilled to bring up now Michelle Dunnity from Intel. Thank you very much. Well, I am um, a little bit under the weather, so we'll see how long we last. I, and, and if all else fails, well, actually, even if all doesn't fail, we can always bring Peter back up for some really good informative stuff. I've been a fan for a very, very long time. So thank you for those kind remarks. Um, so I, I don't have any slides, because we're going to talk about the ghost in the machine this morning, which was kind of my assigned topic. So I don't know if you saw Brian Cantrell's uh, energetic speech yesterday. I don't know if Brian is here. I'm not going to be that energetic. I thought I was the most like, energetic person on the planet until I saw Brian's speech. I was so excited about that. Um, but the ghost in the machine, um, the concept alone, when I got this email and said, this is, this is what you're talking about this year at Interzone, really fascinated me. And if you're not familiar with the origins of the term, I actually have notes. And, and Leslie uh, Lambert, who you'll meet in a minute, um, knows that I never use notes. I'm trying to be a responsible citizen. I want to, you know, half a century mark, and I'm, I'm maturing here. So I actually wanted to get the, the reference correct. It was Gilbert Pyle, who actually was, was doing a critique of Descartes, Rene Descartes' mind-body paradigm when um, Mr. Pyle talked about the ghost in the machine. So what does that mean, and what does that mean to cloud, to open source, to safety, to protection, and to standards? And so if you think about it, the ghost in the machine, um, you think about Descartes and, and the era of enlightenment. And in, in many ways, we think we're in the era of enlightenment, don't we? We think we're in this information economy and this information revolution and evolution going on. And think about the enlightenment and, and Descartes really trying to figure out the causality. Here we are, this mush of physical presence. Your body is just a series of chemical and mechanical statements, if, then, else. Zeros and ones, salt, not salt, heat, cold, eat, shit, have sex, create humans, die. We're, we're a little bit boring in that way. But it's very causality, and it's very um, predictable in so many really interesting ways. You don't actually need to stick monitors all over my body to know that I have a body and that it does pretty predictable things. And in fact, I'm, I'm quite disappointed that this wearable hasn't really helped this wearable. <laughs> it's just data. Unfortunately, it's data without causality and without directionality. So I actually have to get this piece up and moving. So the ghost in the machine in Descartes' time, you could observe and people became increasingly more interested and what was going on with this corpus. And yet, Rene Descartes himself was a very devoted Catholic for his entire life, and so he was trying to figure out what does it mean to have this scientific, enlightened view of causality, of zeros and ones, and causality married to this other notion of spirituality, 
meaningfulness, intentionality, ghosts in a machine. So I think it's really interesting because he also recognized that there was an influence of whatever this thing is called mind, body, spirit, social, uh, love. It influences this very predictable machine and it causes us to do a lot of things in the material world. So we'll take, a, take us away from the world of philosophy. And what does that mean to us as, as people in the cloud space, in the information society, hoping to create a world that's meaningful and relevant for our children and, and for our elders. I, I think Peter's statistic about how many people each individual will have to efficiently care for in the future, if you looked at that, that list of statistics, the only one with kind of a fighting chance of being selfish is Nigeria, and the fact that that statistic is so low is simply because people don't get old there. That's not a very good outcome. So I think about the other side, the computer science kind of discussion of a ghost and machine. And there are some commentators that say that the ghost is, in fact, bugs. Or after human intervention over time, machines start to break down and do things that are kind of unpredictable. So I think that's an interesting notion as well. So is the ghost our sloppy coding? Is the ghost our failure of imagination? And as Peter alluded to before, most of the important things have already happened. So the things that are driving us forward today, this notion of open source, this notion of shared connectivity, this notion of globalization, the tracks have been laid. There's a great video online um, from David Clark. And much like uh, this video, there's a, a man who came into his, his lab you know, with a big data center in the raised floor. Um, with his, his young child, and it really struck me. So, you know, and, and Mr. Clark was talking about what it would be like in 2000 when everyone would have access to all the world's information. And he was saying it in this very just kind of calm, inevitable way in the 1970s. And what's interesting for me personally is I was that kid. So my dad was a computer architect and started in mainframes. I grew up on the floor crawling around mainframes, and as it turns out, anybody here did punch cards? So the, there's, there's two bad things that happened together with punch cards. One, it was, you know, the late 60s, early 70s. If, if a hypothetically five-year-old child knocked down a stack, <laughs> the other bad social trend that was going on in the late 60s, 70s was corporal punishment. It was okay to beat the shit out of the kid that did that. <laughs> and I was that kid. So I grew up with, with um, a, a, a dad, obviously a disciplinarian, but also someone who thought about this world of data centers and information technologies, and a mom who took me to law school with her at night, uh, going to law school. So when I went to kindergarten, that was the first time I made it through law school. That's my joke, is I went to law school twice. Uh, it took me a while to get through. But understanding how these worlds come together is another ghost in the machine, isn't it? Policy, law, we're saying things about what these, these machines should do. We're telling them and we're hoping to influence them. But hope is not code and code is law. So how do we drift closer to this world where whether or not we believe that there should be privacy? And of course, my former boss, McNeely, who's still a friend, um, he still won't admit that he was wrong, that we have no privacy, but damn it, he was wrong. As it turns out, humanity wins time and time and again. People want to be individuals. As much as we all have access to the same shops and the same stores, I've never once walked into a ballroom and seen everyone dressed exactly alike, ever. Even in boarding schools where they're required to wear uniforms, we roll up a sleeve, we wear our socks, we untie our thing, we seek individuality, even as we're kind of walking through the mechanisms of code. So this is where I'm going to kind of put the fine point on it and then my panel, I meant to turn on the thing, so I have no idea. I could just go on for a while. Um, this is where, so a year ago here actually at Interzone, I launched the, the Privacy Engineers Manifesto. And it is open sourced, so if you haven't downloaded it yet, don't be a cheap bastard, it's free. So Privacy Engineers Manifesto. And basically what I did, I wrote it with my business partner of 15 years, who was one of the first pioneers in electronic licensing. 
and my dad. Um, so what we did is we really looked back and we talked to people who came out of DEC, who came out of Bell Labs, who came out of AT&T, who came out of the government around the world and said, what works? What continues to work? Eat, shit, have babies, die. What works in the data center? What works in computing? What can we actually create as a combination of software and hardware that creates a structure of respect for human data that influences it, whether you call it religion, whether you call it privacy, whether you call it batshit crazy, you have to let names go through your system. It's increasingly difficult to be anonymous. And so we are forced to confront things like respectfulness. And privacy means something in every different jurisdiction. And yet we can tangibly code for things to say where information goes and when. And, I, and I'll give you the analogy of my data going online, and I won't go into a full-blown thing. So the manifesto rests upon the shoulders of things as boring as system activity diagrams, business process diagramming, UML, metadata modeling. These things matter. Having a documentation of where your information is, it's the first question I'm going to ask for, from you as an internal governance professional. I will walk into your office and say, where's your data? And I guarantee none of you can say yes, because we haven't documented where this information is going. So we're going to have a whole panel to talk about where privacy is going and where security is going and what this means for the cloud. But I'll leave you with this. I think the ghost in the machine can be a very friendly specter, indeed. I think what we can do is take these tangible objects that we understand based on the big data and next year, we'll call it like ultra data. We used to just call it statistics when I was in school. Now it's big data. Uh, but, or, or datamizer. We'll have a datamizer. So when the datamizer comes, what we'll realize is that the components of big data that matter are based on individual interactions on the machine. And it's up to us to create repeatable standards. But we don't have to create them out of whole cloth. We can look at what's worked in the past. And we can create a, a, a future that confronts cultural differences, that confronts the issues of terrorism. What is the right balance between disclosure and keeping things private and unto oneself? And I do believe that this is true, and I think it's possible, and I think it's open sourceable, um, which is very good news for this community indeed. Oh, that's it for me. So I leave you with that. I did do it. Or, or else the system did it for you. So I hope I've it, it knew you would want it to do that. It so, did, yeah. I know, see? Yeah. I wish we could let her go because her voice is obviously on its last leg, but she's <laughs> stuck here for the panel as well. So I'm Michelle, ready. why don't you at least sit down for Excellent. a minute? Um, <laughs> if you begin to Google, there have always been, the first thing that Google will offer you is the rest of the quote, ghosts in the machine because it was a quote from the character uh, uh, Alfred Lanning in the movie version of iRobot, which many people don't realize actually is based much more on a story by Philip K. Dick called With Folded Hands about robots that were told to serve and obey and guard men from harm and took that directive to an extreme. And that's the question of, is there emergent behavior? Are there ghosts in the machine where we think we know what the code is going to do, but at some threshold of scale or connection, behaviors we did not anticipate that are completely logical outcomes, but we just didn't see them coming, um, are going to happen. That's the kind of subject that arises frequently. We start to talk about the mega scale connectivity, loosely known as the cloud. And it's my perfect pleasure now to bring up uh, Jim Rivas, the founder and CEO of the Cloud Security Alliance, which I think is you know, very much focused on this question of, Emergent behavior in massive systems and how do we make sure that, that we are, as, as they, they say in flight training, ahead of the airplane and not the airplane ahead of you. Um, Jim, I'm going to let you bring up the rest of your panel, if I may, and thank you so much. Yeah, in the interest of time, if we could have the rest of the panelists just come, come up here and we'll let them each introduce themselves in the opening statement. So the, the title of our panel is Generation Terrorists. And Sure, that makes us a very popular group here. <laughs> so uh, about 20 years ago, I think I wrote an article for Network World, and I was trying to compare and contrast the IT corporate guy with the IT security guy. And back then, 20 years ago, the IT corporate guy was very popular for providing uh, free PC upgrades for all of his friends. And the difference was that the IT security guy had no friends. 
And so that, I think, has been a, yes. a fairly consistent theme throughout. But when we were talking about what were we trying to accomplish here with uh, this panel and that uh, generation terrorists and Edward Snowden, uh, certainly this um, very big generational shift into cloud computing, this compute as utility, and all the other impacts of tech consumerization is meaning that we are seeing this decoupling of you from your data centers. And what does that mean and how do we think about that holistically from an enterprise perspective, from an individual consumer and a citizen perspective, from a government, the good things and sometimes the bad things that they may do. And to, tr to try and talk about where we think that future is taking us and then to also see what are some real actionable um, points that we can give to you. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna let each of the panelists introduce themselves so tell us a little bit where, about where they came from, their, a little bit about themselves, and then give us kind of an opening statement about what they think some of the fundamental issues that you will probably want to hear about and, and what's on their mind with this topic. And then um, we'll just do a little bit of bouncing after that, and the, the clock will run out before we know it, and hopefully Michelle will still have her voice at the end, and uh, we'll, we'll take it from there. So I'm going to start right over here, which this must be David, who I hadn't met yet, but it's good to see you in person. Thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, so my name is uh, David Fraser. I'm in, uh, I don't know if my microphone is on. Yes. Uh, so I'm an internet and privacy lawyer. I, I practice kind of exclusively in the field of. Uh... Hi. <laughs> Sorry, my name is uh, David Fraser. I'm an internet and privacy lawyer. So I practice exclusively in the field of, uh, of internet and privacy law. <laughs> And uh, just as a matter of introduction, I come at this from a, from a couple perspectives. One is as a geek who's fascinated by, by the technology and the huge potential that it has, but I also come at it from the point of view of somebody who regularly advises kind of clients, customers, and vendors in the cloud computing space, particularly on cross-border transactions. And I'm seeing the, have seen for quite some time, the impact of this, this concept of data sovereignty and concern about uh, data localization and, and those sorts of things and trying to deal with those intractable, uh, intractable issues. Snowden has particularly brought to the fore not only that issue, but the, but the question of the insider threat uh, which is something that I also find very, very interesting and fascinating. And finally, I, I guess I, I come at it from the point of view of a citizen shocked and appalled by this mass warrantless surveillance of, uh, of populations both in Canada and in the United States and, and around the world, and I'm fascinated by the possibility of the technology kind of undermining that uh, and, uh, and reining back in governments that have been uh, completely overbroad, at least recently, in their, in their attempts to surveil uh, the entire population of the, of the internet. So I'm very much looking forward to this, uh, to this discussion. Th thanks very much, David. And so hopefully the, the, you guys can uh, fix that because I'm only doing that once. So uh, <laughs> Le Leslie, how about we, we go to you next? Okay. I, okay, my microphone is on. All right, we don't have to have any. I can do it myself, I guess. <laughs> okay. Can you do it yourself? Uh, Leslie Lambert, I'm the uh, Chief Security and Strategy Officer for a company called Guricle. Uh, Guricle is a company that uh, uh, produces a product that does uh, security predictive analytics. Um, we do, uh, as a product, um, the, uh, the, the founders of the product um, originally um, had another product that was purchased by Sun Microsystems several years ago, which became Oracle Identity Analytics. Eventually, the Sun was acquired by Oracle. So as their follow-on product, um, they've gone into the security realm specifically, but still carrying all of that identity expertise um, into that. So what we do is we take data from uh, your entire environment, from DLP, SIMS, or anything like that, and we bring it all into a Hadoop backend, and then produce a 360-degree view of each identity in your organization. So, the, so uh, from that, um, uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I want to segue to my, my previous background and then I'll sort of come back to what I was just talking about. I came to Guricle two years ago, um, uh, having been the CISO for Juniper Networks. And um, at Juniper, I actually used the Guricle product. Uh, we were using it for, in specific, intellectual property protection um, very interesting that uh, network, I, what I found out at Juniper Networks when I joined that company was that networking engineers are not company loyal. They're very, they move around to Cisco and Aruba and Palo Alto and all of this. And the fun thing is they, they take all their IP with them. And so I partnered with the general counsel of Juniper because all we had was a whole bunch of warring lawsuits between the different networking companies 
um, you know, you have my stuff, I have your stuff, you know, all of that. And so we thought, well, we'd try to sort of stick maybe a cog in the machine, not a ghost, to sort of stop it and find out what that was about. Um, so private, uh, previously to um, uh, joining Juniper, I was with Sun Microsystems for 18 years. You're going to see a little common theme here um, as we get over to Michelle. Uh, we were partners in crime and <laughs> at Sun. Um, I was the CISO for Sun Microsystems uh, for the last five years I was there. Um, but kind of getting back to the, uh, the, the piece about Guricle, um, it's sort of related to this topic. Um, when I started there in uh, 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 2013, I guess it was, I had to count, what year is it now? Um, that, uh, you know, by that summertime, uh, I think it was July, August time frame, maybe September, was when the Snowden event sort of came to light. And the interesting thing was we thought, wow, if Booz Allen Hamilton had had our product, they would have already known what he was doing. And interesting thing was, two weeks later, they became our customer and also a reselling partner for our product. <laughs> so, um, so that's been sort of our experience of being able to leverage and say, well, if they had had our product, they would have known this. Um, the other fun thing that, and I did just a little bit of homework, because obviously I come from the US, A. Eh? Um, <laughs> um, is I would like to somehow draw out of you um, maybe some discussion about C51. <laughs> um, uh, because I think that's a very, very interesting piece of legislation that's working right now. Um, and I think um, uh, we have nothing like that in the US um, per se. We do have the US Patriot Act, which allows them to do everything and anything anyway. Um, but uh, C51, I think, is a pretty good discussion. So I think I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. thanks. Great, thanks. Tim. Just make sure my mic is working, is it? Yep. Yep. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. First thing that worked this morning for me. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, just a quick segue, actually, we have a condo in Canmore, so I thought it'd be brilliant to stay out there last night, so my alarm went off at 8 this morning, so um, <laughs> sorry, I did shower, honest to God. Yeah. I you look pretty good. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, folks. Yeah, so I'm Tim McCrate. I'm the uh, Director for Enterprise Information Security across the globe for Suncor Energy. And prior to that, I've had positions, senior positions in security, including the CISO role for the province of Alberta. Um, I came to my security career probably in a different path than the folks here. I do remember RACF, and I remember all of the lovely cards that had to go into that. I actually remember starting my career kicking out hookers and drunk curlers from a hotel lobby in Winnipeg was my first <laughs> job. <laughs> yeah, it all got better from there. But anyway, so that was my first introduction to security. That was just last night. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was just last night. Yeah, so I was late. Um, <laughs> so from, uh, yeah, second, yeah, I'm, I'm just here job. for the commentary and the comments, folks. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm here for the you comedy. You don't have much. He's kind of uh, between, between I mean, the two I'm of us. Between <laughs> two, these uh, actually, it was interesting when I took a look at this topic. Uh, the concern has always been, you know, the information that was released, how did it get there, et cetera. So I, I kind of want to spin that back to the folks in the room and the companies that you represent and ask you, what are you doing with your data? What the hell are you doing letting a contractor get access to that kind of information? And if you really care about your information, private or public or corporate, what are you doing to protect it? Can anybody in this room really put up your hand and say, yeah, my company does an awesome job of identifying, protecting, storing, and destroying every piece of information within an organization? And then the room got quiet, and I handed over to the next person. <laughs> <laughs> So hello, Michelle Dennity. I, in my day job, when I'm not talking about philosophers, I'm the chief privacy officer for Intel Security. Um, I do come from a legal background, but I kind of went feral in 2002 uh, when I created the role of chief privacy officer for Sun Microsystems, and that's when I became a partner in anti-crime with Leslie. Um, and worked with Jim from the very, very beginning of cloud. My, my role when Sun uh, was finally purchased by Oracle was chief governance officer for cloud computing. And so in, in that role, um, which was under the CTO's office, we really um, asked ourselves the question, can there be a cloud that is a multi-tenant model that is robust enough for um, you know, clearances of any government um, and, and if so, which government? And confronted issues um, facing companies like Betamax and v VHS. Do you go blue? If you, want a, if you want a cloud, do you have, who is the terrorist that you are gonna allow in? 
because you've allowed in enough um, encryption and, and anonymity and, and pockets of, of unmonitored space in the cloud space. And so it, it's the, the technical controls that you have to have to soothe your customers, but it's also these, these um, legal, philosophical, cultural controls that say, you know, is it, is it okay for a society to pay for its compute power on exploitation of, of people? Um, which can, in many cases, be the case. So it's kind of that balance. And then the, the other thing, um, because we've already talked about Snowball, I mean Snowden, um, <laughs> Animal Farm anywhere, four legs good, two legs bad. Um, I think I'm glad that I've, as a privacy person who had to beg people to pay attention to my boring little niche home, I'm thrilled um, that people are paying attention and thinking and starting to have a dialogue that we've had for 20 years. I'm happy about that. What I think it, it really signals most, though, is a failure of, of curiosity and journalism. Because I had this, this uh, conversation with one of the original reporters in that case. And you know, it's not, it's not an indictment of this gentleman himself. But I said, you know, not for nothing, but at Black Hat, every single year, we talk about government surveillance. You know, the ACLU in, in the States has sued on, on the um, kind of information of a very brave person who, who sacrificed a very long and, and storied career to bring this information to light, and you didn't care. You didn't care until a young man with a pole dancing girlfriend <laughs> skipped off to Russia to have the borscht. <laughs> so I'm glad we're having the conversation, but there's a lot more things that we need to be curious about than just that. So let's not just constantly look over our shoulders and say, ooh, let's, let's really think about what, uh, what proactively we want to create and, and what is the role of information and what is the role of journalism and what is the role of having an informed um, consumer base. And, and consumer can mean everything from citizen individual or enterprise consumer. So we can't just blame the NSA for everything and just have a shorter panel. OK, cool. all right. So Simon, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Um, my name is Simon Crosby. Uh, I was long ago the founder of a company called ZenSource, which built the Zen Hypervisor, runs AWS and a bunch of other big clouds. Along the way, built a bunch of other very secure systems by design. And now I'm the CTO and co-founder of a company called Bromium. And by way of a journey, let me flip it around. It's a very interesting question as to whether or not you can make a device which is secure by design, which inherently will protect you to the extent to which you want to be protected, manage and control your privacy inherently as a property of the device. So treat my approach to this problem as being one which is fundamental, simple. I'm just an engineer. Um, can we build systems? which in your hands will protect you? And the good news is the answer is yes. Uh, the technology, by the way, goes back to 1970. There's nothing really new here. Um, but we can build systems that are vastly more secure by design than the leaky install base that you have today. I have a side agenda here, which is to let you know that the security industry lies to you. Okay. And if you hadn't figured that out, then you really need to know it. There is a $70 billion industry full of lies, which is incentivized really by selling on fear, telling you that you're about to get had just the way that Sony was had and everything else. Actually, I think it's time to applaud us for what we do and we do right. Um, every one of you who is in charge of data, who looks after it carefully, deserves a round of applause. And my key message to you is move on. Move on, move up, get modernized, get out of the traditional IT practices, adopt cloud, adopt more modern systems. The world is better looking forward. Um, similarly, anybody who is telling you, I cannot get off of Windows XP or anything else, just tell them, shut up, move on, okay? <laughs> shut up, move on. Very simple methodology. We can build a much more secure future. A system, by the way, which is even will protect you and protect your assets even in the face of a determined insider. Of this, I'm confident. Okay, so the, technology, the technologist in me uh, is very confident that the world looks much better forward. And then we can start to incorporate wonderful things around a, a societal discussion around privacy. But we have to start with fundamental technologies that will 
help us do the job. That's very, very well stated and quite provocative to think about our industry as potentially going for that quick sale by scaring us into maybe doing the wrong thing. And so it'll be good further discussion. I think we'll also want to pick Simon's brain a little bit here on what that, how, how we do this from an ec economics perspective and, and actually make security and innovation something that we can prove is, is something that just makes the most sense from the bottom line perspective. And what, what I think I wanted to do is to uh, start out is to, to drill back into where I think more of Tim and Leslie are right now to understand a little bit more on this enterprise side and the enterprise challenges of how we are, are protecting ourselves and protecting our organizations in this hybrid world and, and as distributed and um, how we disseminate information and data even created by individuals. And something I read that Dan Gear wrote a couple years ago, three years ago maybe, which was I think in the wake of WikiLeaks and that he posited that the internet treats any attempt to protect information as a routing error. And I think that's you know, pretty probably well stated. And so it's easy to talk about how we can maybe do this, but how actually can we do this? And, wh and what are the things that we aren't doing? Um, and, and don't say we aren't doing them if we don't have solutions that are actually implementable to be able to do some of these things. I, you both maybe touched on some of that, but maybe you could go um, help the people out there who are facing this quandary and have people with their tablets and their phones and their cloud services and everything, and, and they don't even have visibility into a lot of this, and, and what should they be doing, and, and what are some things they can be doing from a strategic perspective, from a tactical perspective. So who, who wants to take that first? Leslie. Um, sure. Um, I think that um, I love Dan Gear, and um, I, as I was sitting here thinking, um, a, probably a corollary to his comment is, you know, information wants to be free, right? <laughs> um, you know, so it, uh, um, and I really do believe that. I think data wants to be free. I think information wants to be free, and, and certainly, um, you know, in, in certain uh, parts of the globe, uh, you know, we, we want to err on the side of um, being able to uh, get a hold of information, seek information, learn, be informed, um, and there are certain pockets of the world that, that don't want that to happen. But for those of us who are fortunate enough to be in the place where everything wants to flow freely, um, you know, we, we have to, and I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but we have to understand, you know, what's more important than other things. And if it has to do with national secrets or it has to do with, you know, pro uh, protecting intellectual property rights of, of organizations, enterprises, uh, whatever, or a personal health information, um, um, child identity, anything like that, you know, we want to be able to um, sort of segregate that type of information and do a better job of protecting it than, than uh, just stuff. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about, you know, Hillary Clinton's email and I'm thinking, it's probably as boring as mine. <laughs> so um, the fact that everyone wants to look at it, you know, about yoga classes or whatever like that, I keep thinking, you know, it's, um, it's uh, email is, uh, is sometimes, I think, interesting to protect, but uh, I think there are other things that are, that are more important to protect. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a sort of dyed-in-the-wool old technology uh, geek girl here who, uh, you know, was a CISO and before that was a, a technologist for several years. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm all about hygiene and, and all of those great um, uh, information technology, you know, tried true, you know, um, you know, people, practices, you know, technology, things like that. And so I think there's still a place for that. And, and then I also think about, um, you know, the experience that I had at Sun Microsystems uh, running the security organization in a very uh, unique fashion. Um, and this is, you know, and, and Sun was acquired by Oracle at the very beginning of 2010. So if you think about sort of cloud and, and, uh, and those experiences, and we leveraged a lot of what um, Michelle's organization at that time was, was doing and their, their promotion of uh, uh, cloud computing in the world. We, we delivered security services. Uh, I delivered actually uh, information security services to Sun using 11 different managed services. Now that was 11 different managed services back, you know, going back to 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, around that space. And it was interesting for me to learn that 
Um, but when we were being acquired by Oracle, and it, I, I apologize to anyone who is here who works for Oracle Corporation in advance. <laughs> just in general. <laughs> yeah, just in general. We we'll feel sorry for you. feel sorry <laughs> for you. Okay. We all okay. do. All right. I got to get out of town today. <laughs> um, uh, was that uh, the, the manner in which that company managed security was uh, 180 degrees from that. That, and Michelle can testify to that, that, that all of their data is, is internal, everything all processing internal, and nothing leaves the 48 contiguous states. Jeez, look at her. <laughs> um, so they, so uh, similarly, they dismantled everything that I had put together in, in this fabulous uh, partner security program um, uh, that we had together. So I think that, you know, they're, um, you know, as uh, the gentleman at the end was saying, you know, there's a reason to go to the cloud. There's so many efficient services. There's so many things that are out there now. Jim's organization has provided all of the security, um, you know, mechanisms and uh, details around it. Um, so I, if I had to do it all over again, build it all over again, I'd do it uh, even more aggressively. Great. Thanks. And, and Tim, what do you have to add to that? And you've, you've done this both from a government side as well as the private sector. <laughs> I don't know if that, either one of them is great, but yeah. Um, so I'm not from Oracle either, just so you guys know. So, you, know. Uh, you know, I'm going to echo some of the comments, but I'm going to raise a, a couple of new ones. That's so, you know, being an old school security guy and, and having to, you know, go through the ranks where we used to say no and we used to mean it. And you could actually shut a project down by saying, you know, there's too much risk, we're going to stop this, or you know, this project has to end. So we kind of lost the, that right. The good old days. Yeah, the good old days. Yeah. <laughs> I miss those. Right? Um, so we lost that right a long time ago. So from a security perspective, right, the goal now for us is just to keep identifying the risks and what's out there. When cloud first started coming out, I was one of those, I think I was one of the, you know, from a security perspective, you could just hear the sphincter tighten when someone said cloud. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of biology going on. Yeah, I was, she started it, so I'm just following up here. Just um, tightening up. Just tightening up, yeah. So from, you know, from a security perspective, we were like, Jesus, what, what are you thinking sending this stuff up to the cloud? Do you know where the hell this stuff is going? Who's going to take a look at this stuff? And over the years, right, so as my, you know, as I grew as a professional, if you want to call it that, or as I started understanding that, you know what, Jesus, some of these guys in the cloud organizations are doing a better job than I could with the budget and the staff and the training and the technology that I currently have in place. So why not leverage what I can? And, and then the other trigger for that, and just, it's just happened this past few years, is how many people are wearing Fitbits or devices that generate something, yeah, from, yeah, this one I'm going to pick on. Um, do you care where that data is going? or who takes a look at the data. I, I guess what it's really come down to me in this just a lot, the latter part of my career is it, this is your information as a corporation or as a government or as an organization. What do you want to do with it? And, and if you're going to protect something, for God's sake, let me and my crew know so I can spend the little money you give me every year, that paltry little chunk of change, and I'll put it in place to protect that stuff that's important to you at either a board level or a ministerial level or a corporation level or a shareholder perspective. And the rest, I salute. Right? If you want it to go to the cloud because it's more efficient, more effective, and to Simon's point, it, it probably will offer you better benefits short and long term. Let's do it. But let's do it in a, in a very organized fashion so we all sitting at the table have an appreciation of here's the risk, here's the data, here's where it's going to go, and more importantly, here's what, what's left, what's behind the wall, what's the stuff that I have to protect. Because that's the stuff I will spend an incredible amount of time protecting if you tell me to. Otherwise, I'm going to be the bulldog and just spend money wherever the hell I can. And I'm going to protect everything at the same level. And that's ridiculous. Uh, we, we just we need to get out of that mindset where I'm throwing everything into one big tub and I'm going to protect it the same way. Stop. Just stop. Take a look at the stuff that you currently have behind the wall. And it, is it worthwhile? Like in my current organization, we're looking at, I think it's like five levels of classification. Stop. Just stop. <laughs> stop, for God's sake. But Tim, it'll work with Microsoft. It'll work with, I don't, I don't give a shit. Stop. <laughs> what do you want to keep? What do you want to give away? What can we give to somebody else to manage? How much savings is that going to mean for me in the data center? How much effort do I now have to expend just protecting that small amount of data that's sitting on two virtual, two virtual blades in different parts of the globe? Awesome. That I can protect. Everything and anything, I can't. I can't do it. We come back to the concept that they're already in the house, right? The, the intruder's already there. And I guarantee you in almost every organization, something's already happening inside your shop that you're not aware of. So why not just take the data that we need to protect and the stuff that's the most private to us and protect it? and let our Fitbits and everything else go to the cloud. So Simon, what do you think? Is that more likely, less likely to protect well, you by putting so it in the I cloud? Think it's, I think it's really, you know, this cloud thing is often a red herring. You know, I, 
think the most insecure place for any data is in control of humans. Because we're all old, and we're getting older, and we trip over Ethernet cables, and we do stupid stuff, and we misconfigure things, okay? So the more quickly we can get it to places where it is under control of highly automated, anonymized, suitably anonymized fabrics, the better. Encrypted at rest, encrypted on the wire, encrypted at all times, except when it's running on the CPU under your control. Great, that's where I want it. I do not want any of my data under your control, whoever you is, for some definition of you. Because I don't know you. I don't know, you know what you're gonna decide on any given day. And so I'm a big fan of cloud. I'm a big fan of systems that have been built for and engineered for the modern world where they know that they're gonna be attacked 100% of the time, a million times a day, and you have people who are massively incentivized, in other words, their business will fail if they do not do a good job for security. That's where I want my data. I do not want my data anywhere else, okay? I want cloud systems that are secure by design, and I want client systems that are secure by design because the enterprise is a decent network provider. Oh my God, don't try me on that one. Okay, so the enterprise, this idea that you can build a secure perimeter for your network, please just let me off that one. It's just a joke, okay? It's just a joke. You're, you're just no good at it. And that's not your fault. It's not your fault the vendors sell you all this guff they basically sell you a bunch of tools which give you a haystack full of alerts and make you go and pick through it with humans to find the needle. It's a complete joke, okay? So the quicker we can move to a cloud and secure client posture, the better. By the way, I think there's a very interesting analogy here. Where we will end up with is that the massive systems companies will be in a very interesting position relative to your data. Look at the lawsuit between the federal government and Microsoft where the feds in the US are trying to get access to some data which lives on a Microsoft server in Ireland. And Microsoft is saying, fine, tell the Irish government to tell me to give them the data. But I am not fetching it for you, the US government. This I love because Microsoft is just, their whole <coughs> business depends on defending my privacy at that point. I want Microsoft on my side. I want Amazon on my side. I want the biggest guys on my side because they will protect me better than any old company whose services I happen to use. So uh, Simon is telling you, if you think you can uh, make your systems idiot-proof, someone in your company is going to build a better idiot. So that's just something you got to be aware of. And, uh, I, but I, I think let's, let's go with this, that we are understanding this and we are crossing that, that threshold into cloud and we're adopting it. And I want to bring this to David to talk about it from a Canadian perspective and a policy perspective. Then when we talk about cloud, well, what cloud does that mean? Does that mean a Microsoft, a Google? Does it mean that that's a, uh, a Bell Canada cloud? Um, and, and maybe, David, you could talk about what's happening um, sure. and kind of give the arguments from both sides, and then if you want to weigh in on either one of those sides personally, feel free. Well, I think that the Microsoft and the Ireland example is, is a really great kind of jumping off point because it, it really does highlight, we've seen, and, and I've seen this since I, I started practicing in this area and cloud computing started to, to be a thing, this, this imagined notion that keeping data in Canada is somehow going to keep it safe from this kind of global, yeah. global yeah, right. surveillance. Exactly. Exactly. Which, is, yeah. which, which is, in, in fact, a significant fiction. We have a mutual legal assistance okay. treaty between Canada and the U.S. Ask, uh, ask many people who have been kind of sucked into it, the amount of information that's shared across the border. And then you get into, so you would think that the data in Ireland is going to be subject to Irish data protection laws and is somehow going to be exempt from, from this sort of stuff. And we're starting to see that, that the, the, the powers in, associated with surveillance and getting this information are, in fact, uh, incredibly powerful and try to leap across borders. And so the borders and, and kind of the, the, in fact, the exact location where that data is, is less, than, less than absolutely relevant. And also in, in the larger cloud infrastructure systems, you have that information. It's in Ireland. It's in Denmark. It's in South Carolina. And, and maybe one, one copy of it is in Canada, but, but unlikely. And so we're, we're seeing this sort of policy system uh, that's, that's somewhat broken. The response in, in some Canadian jurisdictions is, is a little bit silly and disconnected from that. 
In British Columbia, no public body can allow personal information to be stored outside of Canada or accessed from outside of Canada. Same in the, in the province of, of Nova Scotia, but you can give it to Microsoft in those jurisdictions that Microsoft, Oracle, and everybody else who's an American provider is subject to those laws, and they have to, have to hand that information over. And so I see in, in a number of ways the policy framework is broken. A judge in, a federal judge in Washington state is going to decide that issue and ultimately it will hopefully go to the Supreme Court of, of the United States, but the U.S. will not let go of that bone and that's always going to be fought over. And the same thing we, we see at the same time that Canadian companies are concerned about this and Canadian citizens are concerned about this. We have C-51 that's been introduced. We have, not many people are aware, we have a Canadian Patriot Act that was came into law on December 24th, 2001, kind of Merry Christmas Canada, that has the, the exact same <laughs> offensive sorts of provisions. What I would like to see would be, that, and we're starting to see a, a development of technology that is better than the policy process, that is ultimately making it difficult for or impossible for, for example, Microsoft to hand over that email in the United States because it has been promised to be secure to a European customer and, and, and sitting there. I would like to see the, the technology with encryption and tokenization and, and smart systems move in, in that direction So that because we're, we're not going to see the policy development move in a way that's going to make it any better. Or you end up with these stupid laws like in British Columbia, they're just kind of a completely blunt instrument that don't take into account for example, I, I remember during the, the, the Vancouver Olympics, I got an email from an elementary school teacher in, in British Columbia who their students wanted to kind of blog about the Olympics. They were super excited about that. But that would mean that they would have, but they had no budget. So it's either WordPress or, or, uh, or a blogger by, uh, by Google. And they couldn't do that because of this legislation for information that was going to be completely public on the web anyways, because the legislation doesn't take that, that sort of thing into account. So to count on the policymakers to fix this problem, I think certainly we need to put pressure on them. Uh, but they're not going to solve any of these problems. I'm, very, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, I don't know whether I can say I'm optimistic, but I'm hopeful that technology is going to play a significant role in dealing with these, uh, these what currently are, are somewhat intractable issues. So Michelle, I'm assuming what David's saying is kind of in your wheelhouse on how you think we need to do this when I think about how vast and, and your your company certainly wants to sell billions and billions of chips they're going to monitor and look at us all the time. So, I mean, can can you explain to me why Michelle Dennity is not Don Quixote in her <laughs> approach to privacy? Oh, I think I need a hot toddy for that. <laughs> oh gosh, there's so many. Yes. So, so yes and yes. And, and is she Don Coyote? So I, I will take a, a little aside here last night. So one of the promo videos that we did for this conference, um, the headline was Michelle Dennity says, bring back child labor. And uh, <laughs> what, what I actually was saying was that instead of having focus groups of, of younger people like, like they want to blog um, and, and not having them in on specifications and requirement statements, you know, creating the problem statement before you add technology. So, you know, technology just accelerates stupid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. this isn't hopefully, you know, garbage in, garbage out, that thing, remember that? Now it's garbage in, gospel out, because it's big data. <laughs> and it's louder. <laughs> it's still just accelerating stupid, right? Am I right? Yeah. So, um, I think, um, so as far as Don Quixote goes, I think, um, it, it's been an interesting journey together. I mean, I remember when there were four members of the Cloud Security mm -hmm. Alliance, which is shocking. Mm -hmm. There once were four. Mm -hmm. That's astonishing what you've what you've built, Jim. And, and I think and I was counting myself too. Yeah, I think that's you, <laughs> me, and like Nils, maybe uh, Nils Pullman. Um, but I, I think what it shows and it reflects is um, starting to creep out in a very positive way. There are examples. Um, like these school children that demand better. Um, when we built the healthcare system, we, in a, in a former company, not Intel Security, but um, built the healthcare system within Canada, it was always fascinating to me because they would bring their, you know, all the government officials would pile down to California and Silicon Valley and, and we would put together, you know, all the contractors would come together and we'd, we'd work on the solution. And during every break, this is what every person did who had, were inherently government professionals. <laughs> and I was like, well, what are you doing? Checking my email? Breaking the fucking law. 
<clears throat> Isn't this why we've been fighting for like a month and a half on this provision? Because your data can't leave and here you come down here in my shop and you're breaking the goddamn law. Beep, sorry. <laughs> edit, edit, edit. But I, I found it so interesting because it was just, it was, it was almost so naive and, and it literally was a conversation about how we could make sure that our subcontractors never had so much as a storage tape drive repaired, encrypted, or a key stored anywhere across the border, and yet these leaky ships are like do, 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 you know, coming down because, and it's not because information wants to be free, it's because we didn't try to solve the right problem. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's where Don Quixote comes is, you know, what is the problem that we're solving and are we creating, um, you know, and, and this is, again, I keep going back to, like, you know, the, the privacy manifesto really is just kind of my mind sketching over the last 20 years or so. It is saying, if you actually do a swim lane of what happens, where is data produced, who needs to touch it during its life cycle, what do you want it to do? Then you can fill in with some of these very old structures and technologies, as Simon was saying, and some you, you realize where intellectual property must be created. Are our identity management systems growing up in an era of not privacy by design? That's a political term. You know, privacy good. <laughs> Yay! How about privacy engineering? Like zeros and ones. What are the specifications that say the problem I must solve is it must stay in jurisdiction? Well, then you have to know what jurisdiction is, okay? Thing number one an engineer can do. Who needs to access it? Where must they be? That's like three more things that need to do. So when we define our problem, even before we start building, I will start to kind of look at that architecture and go, is the problem that we're actually trying to solve limitation of information spread or are we trying to solve kids wanting to be reporters on a certain significant Canadian event? That's a different question and that's a different solution going forward. And this is where the cloud becomes incredibly interesting because if you're solving the right problems and you're, you're creating these business activity diagrams and you're understanding the swim lanes of production of data, then you're picking the right clouds for purpose. As Simon was saying, I think there will be more purpose-driven um, clouds. And, and I'll give you my analogy that I, I think is because there's always a debate of ownership for data in the legislations. Oh, of course, we own the data about ourselves. So I, I have produced two humans. I'm quite proud of them. Um, I like them a lot, usually. One is 13. It varies. But when I drop them off in daycare when I was little, uh, when, when they were little, <laughs> when I was little, um, I dropped them off at a certain facility that had people that had food, soft places to nap, brightly colored things, hanging out. You could use it in my office. I could, it could be your office, and that's exactly my point. So it could be a mall, or it could be a place that's dedicated to handling children. In neither place have I, have I abdicated my ownership or my care for those children, when someone decides to give them square-shaped crackers versus fish-shaped crackers, I don't really need to know. It's an insignificant event. If you've decided to like hire them out to Michelle's child labor force to create specifications for code, I probably want to know <laughs> details. I, and I do think, actually, we can create a scholarship for that. That's a different story. Um, it's the same thing with our data. How do we? We make sure that we're putting our health data into a health daycare center mm -hmm. and that we can retrieve it when we need to and we can abdicate the roles and the processing of that data to the professionals where that is insignificant and immaterial to us. And, and that is the problem that needs to be solved and that's where the legislative um, conversation is, is starting. I, I'm still hopeful. I, I really honestly, if you had told me in 1999 that all of our privacy laws would be completely balkanized and it still would be about jobs preservation rather than making sure that information traveled the world like we did with shipping lanes in the 1500s. Like we've, we have figured this shit out before in life where ships traveled and it was hard to get from place one and two and it was your entire fortune that was the precious cargo like our data. There were pirates that routinely went out and so we created shipping lanes and then we created agreements 
If there was even one sailor left on the ship, it still belonged to a sovereign entity. If everyone abandoned it, then it was tools that any other sailor could happen upon and have. Mm -hmm. Why haven't we had this dialogue? I don't, I don't well, know. It, it, it seems as though when data and compute was a constrained resource, it was maybe easier to think about how we did this. But I mean, Simon, you've sort of talked about maybe these big providers are being the less evil choice for this. So, well, I mean, I, I mean, to my mind, so let me, the people who we're looking to build policy here don't even have email accounts, right? So the chairman of <laughs> they're perhaps, oh, right, they're still printing emails out and dictating replies to their secretaries, which is okay. So the, this, <laughs> don't ex, you know? Don't wait for any great stuff to come out of this bunch. So I don't <laughs> think we're going to. I don't think that the process of, of contemplation of how, how, you know structurally approaching these is going to work. I think we're going to have to take control by ourselves. And that's the so, and as a simple technologist, I think that is the way forward. I also think that businesses are going to succeed by addressing consumer needs for privacy, or at least big ones will fail if they fail to do so. Yeah. Okay. Now there are some that really ought to terrify you. Google being one of them. That is, is Google inherently bad? That's a, a very good question. Ultimately, nobody knows, and. You don't get to ask the question, but Google's on every web page you've ever visited. They're, uh, they know more about you than anything, right? So, you know, there are some companies which amass vast amounts of data. You just have to hope that they're good, uh, and your ability to challenge that is, mm -hmm. it's it's gone. But in general, can we? How will we make it better? To my mind, the biggest problem is the fact that we exist in a legacy computer environment where our data is already being accessed, either when we're online and so on, and contributing it sillyly to different things, or it is being stolen from us. So I just got rich information from Anthem about my children. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so you, your data is getting out there one way or the other. How can we fix this? The only way that I can think of doing this is by building systems which are vastly more secure by design, okay? We've just got to do it. I mean, I'm all for policy and everything else. I just don't hold out great hope that, that, that we can actually get people to do the right thing. I also think that as technologists, we can build technology which mirrors our humanity. So what is, here we are in this room, literally, and every one of us is role modeling something which in the security world is known as least privilege. It's also known as need to know. That's how society evolved. Society evolved in that every one of us at any point in time is in somewhat of a risky position. But notice I haven't told you my login information for my bank yet. And I'm not going to. I'm just not. Okay. So this whole concept of least privilege, the whole concept of least privilege is how we built society. It is how we built trust and limited trust. So relative to this whole notion of relative trust, again, there's scads of work on it, both by philosophers and by... Uh, you know, computer scientists, we can build systems which naturally implement our own notions of least privilege and then provide people with a choice. Can we take stupid out of people? Nope. We just can't do that, and there will therefore be things that go wrong. But we can build systems that naturally mimic our own human ability to limit disclosure, to protect resources that are of value to me, and we have to do it both ends of the wire, right? Clients and clouds. So, and I think technology is the way. So I, I, I think we're going to have Simon's new manifesto is probably what is going to be our closing statement here. I appreciate that very much. I, this was a terrific panel. I wish we could go for another hour. I hope you enjoyed it as well. So thank them all. And very nice sofas, too. I, I love the sofas. If I was running this, I would have kept the plastic on with these guys here, but you know, that's just me, so. Thank you, fantastic discussion, and yes, I'm sure we all would love to have more. We are at our first break. Um, I owe a posthumous apology to Jack Williamson, who wrote with folded hands, not uh, Philip K. Dick, who wrote everything else that got turned into good movies. Um, and I want to, uh, to, to close by really emphasizing that notion of secure by design. That's, that's something that's such a late idea to the party. I said the other day that the way we do this stuff now is like building our houses with bare copper in the walls and saying we'll add the insulation later. 
Clearly, we don't do that. We build things out of components that had safety and security engineered in from the beginning, and then we use them carefully. Um, great themes and some terrific perspectives on that panel. We are on first break. We'll try to resume uh, on time um, on the half hour. Thank you very much. Oh, and our evolution is sponsoring this break. Our evolution sponsors the next break. Thank them for us. 